there's not much I like better than when a highly respected scholar gives a brutal, honest, and well-considered critique of my work. Grade me. Look at me. Evaluate and rank me. Grade me. So now that renowned Christian scholar Dr. Dale Allison is a friend of the channel, I can get him to grade me. Okay, you're all right. He hasn't evaluated me in years. If nothing else, it's fun to be a cartoon again. Right? Maybe I don't know what a cartoon is anymore. Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. Few, if any, professional scholars and professors bother to put forth a single naturalistic hypothesis to explain the full suite of historical data regarding the resurrection of Jesus. And they don't take a position on naturalistic theories much anymore, do they? They usually don't, because Bargainer says it himself, I'm not going to think of naturalistic theory anymore. And his reason is, according to David Hume, any theory is better than resurrection. So let me give you a theory, just one I dreamt up. I could dream up 20 of these that are implausible, but are still more plausible than a resurrection. But I'm not a scholar, so I had nothing to lose in attempting a full, no resurrection required, narrative a few years ago on my channel. Last year, I even had world-class Bible scholar Dr. Bart Ehrman evaluate it. I think you did extremely well. I mean, this kind of historical insight is rare. <laughs> usually people, usually what people do, of course, they either like endorse the Bible as the inspired word of God and it's all true, or you get the other side that sacks everything and says, yeah, none of that ever, ever happened at all. <laughs> and so like a serious historical engagement is really what we need. So I think these questions are really right on target, and I think you've done extremely well. But Dr. Ehrman is a fellow non-believer so he might be predisposed to agree. So to get the other side of the story, I reached out to resurrection believer Dr. Dale Allison. Happy to be here today. Author of The Resurrection of Jesus, Apologetics Polemics History, and newest lecturer over at MVP Courses, where his series Quest for the Historical Jesus is blowing minds of all theological persuasions. You don't understand Jesus scholarship today without understanding Jesus scholarship yesterday, and you don't understand Jesus scholarship yesterday without understanding its context and, and what led up to it. We'll come back to that later, but for now, Dr. Allison, are you ready to act as my college professor today? All right. Sure. In the early first century, Jewish apocalypticism was all the rage. And among the apocalyptic preachers active in Judea was one Jesus of Nazareth. So what I would say is that there were many Jews in the first century, both before and after 70, who were hoping for the end of time or the end of days or the coming of a Messiah, that sort of thing. I don't know what percentage, you know, we should speak of, but if you want to say many people, then I'm certainly going to go along with that. All right. Jesus isn't the only person out there who's hoping that God will intervene in dramatic and apocalyptic ways. Sure. That's well documented. Excellent. It'll get worse as we go. Okay. This Jesus said or did the wrong things at the wrong times to the wrong people, and so was crucified on a cross, a routine practice at the time. Okay, so you're not going to clarify the wrong things at the wrong time, huh? I'm making the most general possible case. But feel free to pick it apart. No, so I'm not, I'm not sure what you're saying here. So Jesus is a public figure, and he's doing something that calls the attention of people who have power, and that would include the Romans. I also think there's some sort of participation in his end by certain Jewish leaders. But then the debate, of course, is always what exactly did he do to make people so upset? Did they think that he was getting too popular? There were too many people following him. Did they think he was opposed to Caesar? Did they think he was a violent revolutionary? Did they understand him properly? Did they misunderstand him? Is there anything to the gospel accounts that talk of blasphemy so that certain Jewish sentiments would, would not like him? So you've got a, a bunch of options here. But if you want to say that there was some cause to his death. It wasn't random. There were reasons, and it was associated with what he was saying. That seems more likely than any other scenario. Here's where we're going to start diverging. Yeah. As was standard Roman practice for the crucified, Jesus' body was thrown into an unmarked grave outside of town. So I here we would disagree, all right? We would disagree. So that's the standard practice of crucifixion victims, but there are places in the sources, in Josephus, for example, 
where he indicates that this wasn't universally true, and he makes a generalization about his own time and place. And the usual explanation or argument for this is that when they were not at war and things were relatively calm, the Romans didn't want to offend Jews, or they wanted to offend them as little as possible. And so they let them follow their customs when that was possible. The other thing is, is that you simply have to acknowledge that the earliest sources, which would be, in my judgment, the four Gospels and Paul, all agree that Jesus was buried. And uh, if he was simply thrown out among, um, you know, in, in a ditch and were, were there for the dogs and the vultures and so on. Um, you have you would have to come up with an explanation for why we have the stories that we do, or why Paul says that that he was buried. Okay. Now, even if we roll with the assumption that in pre-war times the Jewish Sanhedrin would always take every body down at night so that they don't defile the land, would that automatically have to mean a tomb burial? Though, would the Sanhedrin not have had their own version of mass graves or unmarked graves? So. Here's the, here's the problem. We have to be really honest. We have some data in the Mishnah about graves for criminals, but we don't have any data from the first century. We simply don't. It's not there. So two things are involved here. One, if Jesus was not just treated by the Romans, but he was treated by the Jews, and if he was treated then by the Sanhedrin, was he treated the way everybody else was by the Sanhedrin, or was there somebody who thought in this case, for whatever reason, no, I would like to take care of this myself? Or, you know, another possibility that's sometimes raised is that it's not really an honorable burial, but rather they had run out of time and Joseph Arimathea had a cave nearby and he said, I'll put him there for now and we'll take care of it later. There are all sorts of conjectures about this. But if you're asked, I've been frustrated by this to be candid my whole life because we just don't have have the evidence for these things. We'd have uh, Jewish tombs in and around Jerusalem, and some of them are from the first century, but we don't know much about burial that wasn't in these nice stone tombs, and we just don't have the bones, which is an odd thing. I have talked to people who know about these things, and they are surprised that there aren't more bones, that there are that there aren't more romain, remains, whatever the explanation for that is. I think you always have to be modest here, and you have to recognize that the sources are much thinner than we would like them to be. Excellent. When we're doing something like a, a podcast, and we're talking about the burial of Jesus, and we're trying to do it in five minutes, all we can do is sort of introduce preface to the debate. You can't really have a detailed look at all the evidence, pro and con, and so on. In a book, which I wrote called The Resurrection of Jesus, I don't know how many pages there are, 80? I don't know. There was a very long chapter, which is on the burial. And if this were an easy question, obviously yes or obviously no, there wouldn't be 80 pages there. And if there weren't lots of disagreements among the experts, different ways of reading the text, then again, there wouldn't be as many pages as there are on it. And by the way, when I finish the chapter on the burial, you need to read me very carefully because I do qualify my statements with things such as more probable than not or likely. I don't say at any point this is a slam dunk or there's nowhere where I use the word K-N-O-W. Uh, <laughs> allergic to that, okay? Right. You, you have to remember how fragmentary the sources are. That's it. <laughs> Excellent. Well, hopefully I'll be less controversial on some of the rest of these. <laughs> this Jesus had some followers while he was alive, but most disappeared into lives never recorded by reliable history, never to be heard from again, all except Simon Peter and possibly John. Okay, well, there's also a reference in the book of Acts to James, the son of Zebedee. So that might make three, okay? But you are right, and I'm here with the skeptics on this. I'm not with the apologists. So you know that there are some apologists who would say that we know they were all sincere because they were all martyrs. While there are traditions about their martyrdom, the martyrdom of every single one of them, those are, for the most part, 90% late and legendary. And if you actually ask, what do we know about Bartholomew or Nathaniel, the truth is, you're right. They are simply lost to history. There's another thing here that, that people always overlook, and I don't know why they overlook it, but 
it's staring them at the face in Acts 1. So in Acts 1, Jesus says to the disciples, you will be my witnesses, all right? And the Greek word there for witness is also the word for martyr. And I am absolutely certain that people read this as Jesus's prophecy, that they would all be martyred. Mm-hmm. The Greek originally probably means just witnesses, but the whole ideology of martyrdom comes out of the word martyr. And so it doesn't surprise me at all that we have all these legends and traditions. So yes, I would say that we know some things about Peter. He probably did die a martyr. James, the son of Zebedee, at least according to Acts, died a martyr. John, the son of Zebedee, lots of debate about him. There are stories about him. Interestingly, well, let's not get into John, but you're right. As far as the rest of them goes, for all we know, we don't know what they did, right? right. They could they could have gone back to fishing, as far as we know. They could have gone back to fishing, or, you know, maybe Bartholomew uh, was a missionary for 10 years and then said, you know, I'm tired, I want to retire, let's, right. let's go do something else. But yeah, you can't. You can't argue for their identity as a group, in my judgment. Devastated after the death of his mentor, Simon Peter became sincerely, but mistakenly, convinced that Jesus appeared to him, perhaps through a routine post-bereavement hallucinatory experience. Uh Uh-huh. Okay, so there are two things. First of all, I note that you're beginning with Peter. I would begin with Mary Magdalene. So there's a story in John and a story in Matthew. And I'm inclined to think that that is probably an early story and that Mary may actually be actually be the first person to put this all together, but she's not the important person that Peter is. And so what what it really takes is somebody like Peter in in that world, that time and place, in that group, in a patriarchal society, it takes a man to say these things. So maybe that's it. So here's the problem with what you said. You could be right. And I have no way of showing that you're wrong, okay? I have spent a lot of time studying bereavement visions. I've also had a bereavement vision myself. And so the problem is this. If you want to say that Peter had a bereavement vision, and you're talking to somebody like me, I am not persuaded that all bereavement visions are purely endogenous. So for me to say that it's a bereavement vision, is still to leave the question open as to whether there was the, the vision or the hallucination was in response to any incoming data from outside of Peter. Okay, I think we're all hallucinating all the time anyway. I need to make that clear. <laughs> Excellent. You know what the scientists tell us now, and all you have to do is think about it, because we don't have images coming into we don't have images going into our, our, our heads. We have light waves. And then they get translated into chemicals. And then there's some magic in the theater of our minds that turns this into to pictures. So we're always, we're always living inside this theater within ourselves and projecting the images. But somehow they can be informed by outside reality. So that's, that would be the question there. You are appealing, though, to a very common sentiment in society at large. So lots of people would simply dismiss what I shared with you if I say I don't know ahead of time what all the causes were in a bereavement vision, a lot of people would say, well, I'm wrong about that. But, okay? Okay, sure. And I hope I covered that with sincerely but mistakenly. By mistakenly, I meant non veridical Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I got where, I got where you're, you're going. I'm simply saying that if you're asking me to follow along what you're doing here, at that point, I'm going to offer a qualification. I, I appreciate that. Perhaps persuaded by Peter's story, perhaps still convinced by Jesus' message of a coming kingdom, perhaps caught up in social contagion, or for whatever reason, James, the brother of Jesus, and John, son of Zebedee, bought into the resurrection narrative in whatever form they understood it. Okay, now, I'm not sure what you're saying there. Are you saying there that they did this without themselves having any subjective experiences. That is, it's a pure psychological response to Peter. That I'm saying that that is plausible that they... Oh, that's possible. That's just possible in terms of social psychology, yes. But in and of itself, that's a possibility. And think that the apologists would re- respond by saying, well, they themselves had a, a visionary experience, right? They themselves saw Jesus. There was an appearance to the Twelve, as Paul says, or as you have in in the gospel. So that would be the apologetical response. 
But apart from the stories in the Gospels, it is the case that people can, in the right circumstances, want to throw in with a cause and be convinced by a leader. Sure. So I can't falsify that. The stories about Jesus began to spread, not primarily by Peter, but rather through person-to-person -person evangelism of the day. Neighbors talking to neighbors, merchants talking to customers. These conversations prioritized recruiting new followers over relaying accurate history. So details were expanded upon, embellished, or even invented each time they were recounted. As the movement began a life of its own, Peter the Fisherman was not around to personally affirm or correct the tales. Okay, so something like that has to be true, but I wouldn't confine that to the post-Easter period. That is, I think there must be stories about Jesus going around from the point at which he is a public figure. There are always stories about all public figures that are circulating. And there might be a, a, a group that's officially closely connected to the figure, but that those people don't have complete control over everything else that goes on. Just as the administration here at my school, they like to think they're in control, but they're not in control of what people are, are talking about or, or seeing. And I certainly don't think of the Gospels as being, as being historical in details. When, for example, I would argue for, let's say, the historicity of the burial, I would not rely upon the details of the Gospels. When I'm arguing about anything, the best I can hope for is sort of something like the gist of the event or the gist of what was said. agree with you. I also think that you do see clearly in the Gospels points at which you have um, what you have to call legends. In Matthew 27, as you know, when Jesus dies, there's an earthquake and saints, holy ones, uh, are raised, and then they go into Jerusalem and appear to many. So I think it's myself hopeless to defend it of that event. And some of my apologist friends will argue, for, so Mike Lacona argues this, that Matthew himself presented this story as a sort of parable. It was figurative. It was not meant to be taken literally. But I don't see any evidence in the text of that, and I think the evidence is actually against it. And everything we know from the first readers of the Gospels is against that. So I, I certainly do think that there are embellishments and, and elaboration, whatever other words that, that you use. So I'm not disagreeing with that. A few years later, a Pharisee named Saul was traveling around persecuting these new Christians, burying the moral guilt of his actions under a certainty that he was doing the will of his God. But on his way to Damascus, he suffered a psychotic break possibly some form of post-traumatic stress, manifesting in a vision of the allegedly resurrected leader of the group he was harming. So affected by this experience, Paul became a believer and began recruiting for Christianity and writing letters outlining his theology. Okay, so first of all, I don't see how to refute that as an historian, okay? That's the first thing. But the second thing I would say is that People of all sorts have visions all the time. And one of the great secrets of our culture is that tons of healthy-minded people have visions. So you don't have to have a psychotic break. You don't have to be schizophrenic to have a vision. I've had visions. All my children have had visions. My wife has had visions. I know lots of people who've had visions. They have been, in our cases, extremely rare or one of a kind and they say nothing about our mental capability or our mental health. So I would like to emphasize that people have visions for all sorts of reasons. And I also would go back to what I said earlier with bereavement visions and stress that, in my opinion, not all visions are purely endogenous. Now, if you think all visions are purely endogenous, then, then it has to be that this is a purely subjective vision. If you don't think that, then the possibilities are open, okay? Excellent critique. I'm going to take that on board for sure. That's excellent. Okay. Peter, Paul, and John once met to swap ideas, but they didn't actually see eye to eye on things. Yeah, so that's obvious. I don't, I don't know how anyone disagrees with that. It, it, well, you know, there, there, are all, there are a few exegetes in, in history who are uncomfortable with Peter and Paul disagreeing about things, and they will or they have said, John Chrysostom, 
John Chrysostom, for example, was one who said that they really agreed, but they decided to sort of go through a play or pretend in order to make a public statement or lesson. But I think that's ridiculous. And so do most, most commentators. So yeah, that's obvious. And uh, Paul doesn't just disagree with Peter. He refers to people coming from James. And I, I don't see any reason to doubt that these were people who thought they were from James and may well have uh, agreed with James. So yeah, I, I, just as a footnote, I think that whoever wrote the book of James, and it probably wasn't the brother of Jesus, but whoever wrote it, I think he is disagreeing with Paul at points. So here we have a Jewish Christian in the first century who is disagreeing with Paul. And Paul himself says that people accuse him of being an antinomian, of being without law. So Paul is a controversial figure. And I think he's disagreeing with a number of people on a number of things. After several decades, a variety of Greek-speaking people who never met Jesus nor Peter took it upon themselves to begin writing down some of the stories that were circulating about Jesus, the sayings attributed to him, and their interpretations about what those stories mean. Okay, so here we don't have time to argue. So let me say this. I don't think that Matthew wrote Matthew's gospel, all right? And I don't think John, the son of Zebedee, wrote the gospel of John. Let's start with that. Think that the tradition about Peter and Mark is possible. If you look, for example, at the Anchor Bible Commentary on Mark, written by Joel Marcus, he says there, after looking at all the evidence and after working through the text of Mark, that the verdict on this tradition is undecided. So we don't know that it's false. We don't know that it's true. So I think it's possible that tradition is correct, but I can't build on anything much on it because I don't know that it's true. And even if it were true, I don't know how much in Mark, let's say it is true. You still don't know how much in Mark, Mark got from Peter. He must have known lots of other things too. You also don't know how good Mark's memory was or how much he liked to elaborate things or rework stories. And the same thing's true for Peter. You don't know how good his memory was. You don't know how passionately he was interested in storytelling and could cut corners to, to make a point and so on. So I think when you appeal to Mark and Peter, even if it is true, which is only a possibility for me, I don't think the payoff is as much as people think. Now, strangely enough, while I don't know what to think about Mark and I reject the traditions about Matthew and John, I'm, I'm a conservative or traditionalist with, regarding, with regard to Luke and Acts. I think Acts is a post-70 text, but I think that the person who wrote it probably did know Paul and probably was an itinerant who went around the Mediterranean world the way Paul did. I assume that he met a lot of, met a lot of people, and he claims in, in the first few verses to have things from eyewitnesses. So maybe he did have some things from eyewitnesses. But again, that's a sort of apologetical claim that you can find in other texts and you can't just take it on its face. I wouldn't put things exactly the way you do. For me, the, these issues are, are cloudier than that. So I wouldn't just try to disconnect entirely from people who knew Jesus. But, but again, we're here not dealing in the land of hard historical fact. We're dealing in the land of possibilities, or if we're lucky, once in a while, we can say this is more probable than not. But, okay. On occasion, some of the early Christians were troublemakers and suffered consequences because of their disruptive behavior. But generally, early Christians had a very live-and-let-live live existence and only relatively infrequently were bothered because of their ideology, though it unfortunately did happen sometimes. They were accepting of people, kind to the poor and widows, and so grew in numbers. Uh, yeah, that's, that seems fair to me. You have at the martyrdom of James, the brother of Jesus, in the 60s for, for some reason, and then you have some activity under Nero, and the academic tradition, which is probably correct, is that Peter and Paul suffered under Nero. They were martyred. And then when you get to the book of Revelation, I'm one who thinks that there is evidence there that some Christians are being martyred. But it, it wasn't the case that to be a Christian was to be automatically persecuted in the first century. 
And there does seem to be, for the most part, a live and let live and let live attitude. Centuries later, in 303 AD, Christianity did become illegal in Rome for a while, but ten years later was given legal protection and soon became the Roman Empire's first official religion, which is when it really took off into the institution we know today. Uh, which, so I'm not sure how you want to fill out the last part of that, the institution that we know today. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> so I'm, I'm an historian, and I think people in the 4th century are really different than people in the 21st century. But if you want to make a big deal of the fact that Christianity and the state at some point become wedded, then yeah, that, that makes a lot of differences. And it lies behind, let's say, some of the creedal issues because there are times at which emperors call bishops together and say, I'd like you you all to uh, to fix this or to come to some sort of agreement on things. And that certainly isn't going on in the second or third century. In short, to account for the established history of Christianity, we need only a single disciple to claim Jesus rose a later convert who hallucinated the same, and a well-marketed legend to spread. Okay, so we didn't talk about the story of the empty tomb in any of this, so you would have to account for that at some point. I guess you're going to say that it's a legend, since you don't think Jesus was buried. Well, we spoke about the nature of the burial, so I'm not convinced that there was a tomb to No, be... I, th that's clear from your presentation. So if you don't have a tomb, then if you don't have a burial, you're not going to have a, have an empty tomb. Although, I... You know, I, this isn't the place to argue this, but there is a, a passage in, in Isaiah, which is really interesting. It's in Isaiah 52 and 53, where he talks about the servant being buried with the wicked. And the early Christians paid attention to that text. And I think if Jesus had been thrown in a pile with the wicked, I don't think the early Christians would have had a problem with it, because I think they would have found it in Isaiah. I think they they would have done just fine with that. The The crucifixion itself is repellent and ugly and dishonorable. And if they could actually stomach that and Paul could turn it into something positive, I think they could have turned a burial in or being tossed into a ditch. I think they could have lived with that too. And I think they would have found uh, support in, in the verse from Isaiah. So on my own view, which you may know from reading the book, is very different. If I were a skeptic, I would go with tomb robbery as, you know, a part of a skeptical scenario. But I suppose at the end of all this, what what I want to say is what I said at the end of my book. I don't see compelling historical arguments as an historian for, let's say, apologetical conclusions or compelling views, depending on your worldview, for, let's say, the view you just offered. I think that it's a historical possibility. And if you have certain metaphysical, religious, predispositions. If you have certain ideas, let's say, about visions, then it's going to make more sense, a lot more sense than a traditional Christian view. So I don't think history, myself, decides as much as we would like it to. And I think my call it, even though I believe ideologically in some, well, I know. So religiously in some ways, I'm probably closer to some of my apologetical friends than I am to you. I'm, I'm guessing we don't know each other well. But I think they they want too much out of history. I think they can do more than history than we can. I don't think we can do as much as they, they think we can. Excellent. So, if I was one of your students and presented this in class, what kind of grade would you give me on this? Does it pass or fail as a historical hypothesis? Well, it depends on what you're doing with the secondary literature. So, if you know the secondary literature and you're citing it and interacting with it, yeah, you get an A. Excellent. If, okay. You, if it's just you, you don't get an A. Because I always want to read people on both sides of an issue or all sides of an issue and interact with them so that you know the history of the discussion. Well, the most recent resurrection theme book I read was yours. <laughs> okay. And, of course, I've just been through your Quest for Historical Jesus eight-lecture course, which I cannot recommend highly enough. This course is about the so-called quest for the historical Jesus within the academy. I trace the roots back to the Reformation, and then it grows into the Enlightenment 
and it gets adopted by the dais. And what they do is they take these critical tools and this critical attitude and this skeptical thinking, and they turn it on the Bible and above all towards the Gospels. And so people begin to ask, well, who really did write the Gospels? And when were they written? And what sources do they use? And how reliable are they? Do they go back to eyewitnesses? How much is fiction? How much is fact? And so on. And one of my complaints has always been that too many churches simply ignore what has been going on, and I think that's a mistake. So this class, I I hope, serves as a counter to that sort of ignorance. If you'd like to get this Princeton-level education in the comfort of your own home for the price of a book, sign up today at tinyurl.com slash dalejesusquest. And if you use that link, you'll be helping to support this channel, which I greatly appreciate. Anytime. Thanks. This was fun. If you missed our last video together, where apologists like Frank Turek, Mike Lacona, Lydia McGrew, and more attack fellow Christian Dale Allison's take on history, tap on the thumbnail on screen now, and I'll see you over there. Until next time. Take care. Bye-bye. Later. <laughs>